Do I think the church as a whole has lost its focus on the seriousness of salvation? By the way, I like that that uh, profile picture. That's cool. <laughs> I like that. Uh, yes and no. Because sometimes what we call the church is just what we see as a church, but it's not really the church, if you catch my drift. Sometimes we see the folks that are dressed up, or I guess nowadays not dressed up, who go to the buildings and go for the gatherings and say that that's all the church. And then what we do is we number all of those people. And there is a cat. Uh, but what we do is we number all of the people. Let's just say it's a billion. I don't know. A billion people that we number in the church. And then what we do is, what we do is, when they start acting or behaving a certain way, we say, well, the church has gone away. The, the church has gone awry. The church has gone astray. Now, the people that go to the church, there will be a falling away of the belief of the faith, the tenets of the faith, but not a falling away of faith. Are you with me? And so I wouldn't. I w okay, now I got to knock him off because he's getting ready to go in front of the camera. There you go. Good thing he lands on his feet <laughs> because he's getting ready to walk, walk this way and walk right in front of the camera and just sit there. That's what he always does. He'll come and sit right there in front of the camera as the, I think he knows there's a camera there. But sometimes we end up list, we end up um, calling everything that's in the church the church. I understand because there's no way that we can actually identify who is and who isn't. But if if by your question you mean kind of writ large, all of the professed believers, yes, we have gotten away from the main thing. I think we have fundamentally misunderstood salvation. Now, matter of fact, no, you know what? Even to your point, even the actual church. I'm sorry. Let me correct myself. I was wrong. No, even the entire the the, the church. The, the true church has also fundamentally misunderstood and moved away from what salvation is, the importance of salvation. What actually is salvation? The problem is too many people simply don't know what salvation is, why it was put there. Too many people have thought that it's just about one thing and it's not. Being saved is being declared right, being in rights and not righteous of yourself, not that you've done something. Uh, that's not what it is. Being saved is be stated and be seen in right standing by God. How does that happen? That happens. Remember, we're talking about the atonement. All of this is what we're doing right now is what we're seeing that we saw under the old covenant and even prior to the old covenant, even in the garden. It's all about this atonement, this reconciliation. The atonement, there's three elements to it. There's a covering, a canceling and a reconciliation. Now, no, the cat just, just left. So the covering, that means the sin or the debt is gone. Whatever's left behind, the uh, uh, the uh, the collateral damage, the debt that's owed, that's canceled. And because the uh, the sin is canceled, the debt is covered. I mean, the, the, sin, the sin is covered, the debt is canceled. There can then be a reconciliation. God has always wanted to be reconciled with his people. Even after they fell in the garden, what does God offer them? He gives them the ability to bring about an offering to him. We even see so if you just trust God and follow him, he wants to have a relationship with you. Even at that point, even as we go into the, even with, with Abraham, we see Abraham doing the same thing. God wants fellowship with even Abraham, with his people. This is prior to the law. Then we see the law given. What does he give them? He gives them offerings. Why? So that they can have this fellowship with him. That's why under the old covenant, guys, that's why, and it's the same thing that we see now, guys, and you don't get away from this. It's the exact same thing. You see a high priest administering this. You see a high priest who has to have his sins atoned for, and what does he do? He pronounces all the, the sins of the people on the head of the scapegoat, on that lamb, and does what? Send that lamb away. Well, what does Jesus do? Jesus won the high priest who also can identify with us, but does not sin. He's a perfect high priest. And then what does John say? He is the lamb who does what? Take away the sins of the world, just like the scapegoat does. Then we've got this sacrificial offering whose blood is going to be shed on the altar, and it must be a perfect sacrifice accepted of God. And those people who have afflicted their souls, humbled themselves, 
and place their faith in this offering that God has accepted, they are in right standing. At that point in time, it was for one year. And you had to repeat it year after year after year. Now, what do we have? The same thing with better elements, as Hebrews is telling us. We have a better high priest. We have a better scapegoat. We have a better sin offering. And the offering was made one time. This is the problem with how we treat salvation, as though that the blood of Christ was just like the blood of that bulls and goat. We treat the blood of Christ just like it was in the old. The blood of Christ is no better than Bessie the bull. No, Bessie the bull, that's a girl, than Bob the bull. We treat the blood of Christ no better than some animal's blood. Why? Because the blood that was shed on the altar under the old covenant was good temporarily. But then we come back and say that the blood that Jesus shed on the cross is good temporarily. No, it's not. That's why the writer of Hebrews says that he gave his offering once and for all. And once you have placed your faith in him because you are justified, Paul says in Romans, if God has justified you, well, then who cares what anybody else can come back and say? It's God who justifies. They can't bring a charge against you. God is the one that justifies. So because Frank or Bob or Mary or Sue says, no, Corey, you're teaching heresy. Well, listen, to hell with what you're saying, not with you, but what you're saying, because what you're saying is you're accusing God's blood of being inefficient. To hell with that sort of thinking. I literally mean it just how I said it. To hell with that sort of thinking that the blood of Christ is no better than the blood of bulls and goats. That's why it says the blood of bulls and goats is insufficient. It cannot take away sin like his does. That's why he entered into this, this, uh, this sacrifice once. And then what did he do after that? He sat down. The reason why we do cover salvation so much is because that's what the book is about. The entire book from Genesis to Revelation is about our salvation and then us walking in that salvation. So when someone comes back and says otherwise, and still to this day, at present, whether it's Dr. Brown, whether it's Dr. Gagnon or Dr. Whoever, you still can't get past these other parts of the Bible that we bring up that they cannot refute. Well, what about this book? What about that chapter? What about this verse? Fine, we'll cover that. But you can't cover the ones where God has solemnly promised that this will happen to those whom he's placed his, 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 his faith in. I'm sorry, his faith, his spirit in. You can't get past that. And anyone that says different is either ignorant or lying. I'll, I'll give the people the benefit of the doubt that they're ignorant. But to state that those that trample on the blood of God as though it's some cheap thing, well, what's the purpose of him dying? If you can lose your salvation, if you can be atoned for today and then unatoned for tomorrow, that's the exact same situation that the Jews found themselves in. So why did Jesus go on the cross then to have the same thing? He did not. That's And so that's why I retract my statement. Yeah, even the church has has fundamentally dropped the ball in their understanding of salvation, what it is. We are saved. We will, we, we as John 5, 24 says, we have passed from death into life. Passed from it. No more judgment to come. That's it. That's the beauty. So what's the gospel? Not that salvation has come to the Jews. Not that salvation has has come to the world. Nope, that's not the gospel. The good news is that salvation has come to the Jews and to the world permanently. Amen.